Welcome. The following video or audio are the study of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse of the King James 1611 Bible. Our family welcomes you to our household Bible ministry time. You may watch and listen with us. Our goal has been from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Each chapter by chapter we try. And topical preaching and teaching aids you can find by searching different topics. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. Come and appreciate the word of God for our spiritual growth, our development in the word of God by these lessons. Please feel, feel, please feel welcome to upload and share our Bible study with family and friends. Like us, subscribe, write a comment, let us know you heard the message. The video or audio are not copyrighted and should be used and not abused. Thank you. Hebrews chapter 9. Then verily, the first covenant, the Old Testament, had ordinances of divine service, the priests, the tabernacle, and a worldly sanctuary. It was there in the world. It wasn't the heavenly one. One that was built by man's hands, not by God's hands. For there was a tabernacle made. Exodus. The first, wherein was the candlestick. So the first would be the first room, the holy place. And the table. And the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. There's the holy place. And the candlestick, the table, and on it, the showbread. And after the second veil... Going into the most holy place. This is the veil that Christ rent. The tabernacle which is called the holiest of all. The most holy place. Now this is interesting. Which had the golden censer. This is the, this is the item that John the Baptist's father would go into the holy place. And burn the incense of prayer. And yet the Bible records that that censer was in the most holy place. And yet Exodus says it's right by the veil. There's something about that golden censer. It's there in the holy place, but there again, it's in the most holy place. And the Ark of the Covenant, of the covenant overlaid round about with gold. We read that in Exodus. Where it was the golden pot that had manna. Exodus 16.33 And Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. That's the Ten Commandments upon the, the, the stones, the tablets that God wrote on the stones. Again, who would be interested in this information? Hebrews. This is their history. This is the story of their life. This is the book of Exodus. Played out before them. This is not the church. Not for the world. And over it the cherubims of glory. Shadowing the mercy seat. We read about that in Exodus. Of which we cannot speak particularly. We don't know where it is. And yet later on. John's going to tell us in the book of Revelation. It's in heaven. When. The end of Second Chronicles. You read. Uh, the candlestick, the table, all the stuff that went to Nebuchadnezzar. The bowls, the shovels, the sniff pan. That all went to Nebuchadnezzar. You don't ever read about the, the Ark of the Covenant. You don't ever read about the mercy seat. It's gone. And the book of Revelation tells us exactly where. Uh, Harrison Ford is not going to find it on this planet Earth. You want to find the Ark of the Covenant, you need to be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, and you can go see it in heaven. That's where it is. They've got all kinds of stories about it, and that's all it is. It's stories. They haven't read Hebrews. They haven't read Revelation. Now, when these things were thus ordained, Exodus, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, the holy place, where John the Baptist's dad went. Accomplish the service of God. They trimmed the, the, the candles. They trimmed, uh, they filled it with oil. 
They laid out fresh bread. They took away the old bread. They went in there and offered that altar of incense for the prayers. That's the opening of Luke chapter 1. But into the second, second veil, the second room, the most holy place, went the high priest alone once every year. Notice it says alone. That takes out all the stories that, you know, men tied a rope around his ankle and stood by to pull him out. The Bible says he went in there alone. Once every year, Day of Atonement. Not without blood. He couldn't just walk in there and say, Hi God, how you doing? He'd be dead. Which he offered for himself. He's a sinner. And for the errors of the people. And that's not wrong. Because the Old Testament, the sin atonement was for those people that sinned in error, not knowing they did it. It was not presumed or thought out sins. Wasn't that, oh, I'll do this sin and then I'll just bring whatever sacrifice they need to bring. It wasn't like that. The Holy Ghost, thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. The priest did the work, but the priest didn't finish the work. Because here's a guy who's a sinner himself. We learn by Jesus in the, in the Gospel of Luke, they went to Abraham's bosom. So that high priest could not really atone for the sins. The process they did, but Jesus Christ finished the work. While as yet the first tabernacle was yet standing. That tabernacle that stood in Exodus. stood uh, when it became the temple built by Solomon. Which is a figure for the time then present. Old Testament. In which were offered both gifts, free will gifts, and sacrifices, animals, that could not make him that did the service perfect, the priest himself. He went in there for his own sins first, but he couldn't make atonement for his sins. As pertaining to the conscience. That didn't clear their conscience of what they did wrong. It could not. Until you had the sinless blood of the Lamb of God which take away the sin of the world, all you could do in the Old Testament is do something that God ordained which did not finish the work yet. It was a picture. It was a figure. It was a type to come when Jesus came. That tabernacle was supposed to show you Jesus Christ. Which stood only in meats and drinks Divers washings, that's the labor, between the, the, the holy place and the brazen altar. And carnal ordinances, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, imposed on them until the time of reformation. The cross. From the time that Israel left Egypt unto the cross. Yet they had that tabernacle, they had that set up from Exodus 20. But it did not finish the work we read in previous Hebrew chapters. Because had that first covenant been great, we would not need the second. We would not need Jesus Christ. So, if you got friends that are involved in a church priest religion, that their priest can absolve their sins, Run them to Hebrews chapter 9, and what we're going to finish reading this chapter, then just ask him the particular question. Why is there a Jesus Christ if your priests can do what you say they can do? And they'll say, but say, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If your priests can do the work, the sacrifices that are set forth in the Old Testament to revolve our sins and wash our sins away, then there would be no need for Jesus Christ. The fact is that God, his son, Jesus Christ, showed up on this planet and ended up on a place called Calvary. Acts 20, 28's blood is God's blood. 
shows you biblically those priests could not do what only God can do. Yes, Jesus Christ died, but he died for our sins and is resurrected the third day according to the scriptures and he will never die again. So there's something wrong with the Old Testament priesthood. What? They died. What? They're sinners. The wages of sin is death. Now, what we just read in Hebrews 9, if you've got an interested Jew listening, you now can run to Romans 6, 23. And say, look, the first part of this verse. The wages of sin is death. You can deal with him with, now with the New Testament. I, I, I know how you feel about Jesus. But let me show you this verse. Why do we die? Every Jew is going to know we die because, run them back to Genesis chapter 3, because we disobey God, which is what? It's a sin. All right. Now you can run into a, a Romans chapter 3, another thing, which you can now find in the Old Testament. If, you, if you've got to mark your Bible, you got to know your scriptures. For there is none that sinneth. I mean, for all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. That's found in the Old Testament. I believe that's uh, Ecclesiastes. I believe David said something like that. Now you, now you got their interest. If you got them this far, you can run to some New Testament passages which are found in the Old Testament, and you can bring them to this side of Calvary. You know what's wrong with your priests? They're sinners. See the whole priest? He had to do it for himself. Well, how can he resolve your sin if he himself is a sinner? Your high priest, the priest, they died. Well, what good are they? Did any of those priests die for the people? No. Third question for a Jewish person. Hebrew. What good are your priests doing for you today, 2017? They don't even know who the priests are. The priests ain't doing nothing. So according to your first covenant, according to what God has set forth for you by the law. How many times have you gone to Jerusalem this year? None. Well, that's what the law said. When was the last time the high priest went into the most holy place with the blood prescribed for himself and then for the sins of the people, the error? Well, he hasn't because... There is no temple. There is no priest right now. It's doing you a lot of good, isn't it? That opens up now for the New Testament. So what was wrong with the priest? They died and they were sinners. And they died because they were sinners. That's wrong with them. And Israel obeyed and they didn't obey and they left that temple. They just... They, carved the gold off the doors of the temple. They went after other gods. They had Catholic churches on every corner of, of Jerusalem. I mean, altars, sorry. That's what was wrong. All right, so with all that, now let's pick up where we were, Hebrews 9, 11. But Christ, being come and high priest, so see, We've been showing you Jesus Christ by the high priest. And you see Satan tooting his own horn. Of good things to come. From the past. Good things to come. By a greater and more perfect tabernacle. That which we read is in heaven. When Moses was shown by God. And the Hebrews have to read that. Because it's in the Old Testament. That that pattern that God showed Moses was a pattern that was found in heaven. You, a Hebrew can't say, oh, that's, that's New Testament. No, no. Because what was that pattern God gave Moses? It's in heaven. A more perfect tabernacle. Not made with hands. Well, see. Now, with that verse right there, you can rule Herod's temple. You can rule out. Solomon's temple, you can read out that, that you can rule out that tabernacle made by Moses. They were all made by hands. That is to say, not of this building. 
64 AD. That building is still there. The writer of Hebrews is saying, see that temple there? Do you see it? It's made by hands. I ain't talking about that place. And you wait to see what these people are going to see what happens in six years if they're still living. The ones that, the ones that are still living six years, seven years, eight years later. There is no temple. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, and run back to Acts 20:28. 20, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So Christ went through the heavenly tabernacle, which no man can go through, with the blood that is greater than goats and calves, he did it once. Look at verse 7. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood. Our high priest went in there with blood once, forever. For what reason? To attain eternal redemption for us. Who's he us? Who is he speaking to? Hebrews. I know it's us, but we're talking about Hebrews. Fellow Jews. Jesus Christ, you know who he is. It's only been 30 years since you crucified him, since he rose from the grave. It's only been 30 years. Not that long ago. Jesus Christ is much better than your high priest, which are better than the chief priests that crucified him. They were sinners, and yet that blood they bring in once a year can't satisfy God. But Jesus Christ sat down once, 33, thereabouts, A.D. Right around whatever, I don't know what the year is. But that one time that Jesus went and rent that veil into two, when he took his blood and put it upon the mercy seat, sat down right hand of the Father, that is one sacrifice for all. Now, when you got a priest class of, of a religion that says that you have to kill Jesus daily, weekly, in the Mass, or Easter, or for Christmas, violates the scripture because it says once. And there are dedicated Catholics that do that every single day. A violation of the scriptures. And we'll read more about that in Hebrews. For if the blood of bulls and of goats, and the ashes of, of the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the clean. Now remember that that, that that heifer was if they touched a dead body, if somebody became dead by them, if they went out to war and they were gathering spoil among the dead people, they had to wash themselves. They had to have been sprinkled with this heifer to be clean at even. And all that stuff, the goats, the ashes, the clean, sanctify, sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh outside. That was all done for the outside. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, we'll run that back to Acts 20:28. 20, there's Jesus, there's the Holy Spirit, and there's God, the Trinity's blood. Right there. The eternal spirit is the Holy Spirit, there's his blood. Offered himself without spot. So what was the sacrifice called for? Especially the, 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 the Passover lamb every year you were to do it. You were to check that lamb and make sure it had no blemish. So when you study the, the Passover, study Jesus Christ. Because he was the Lamb of God which took away the sin of the world. He was the Lamb of God that died on the Passover. That Lamb was to be without spot. That Lamb in Exodus was to be examined a certain amount of days. Without looking back, you know that John spends a considerable amount of chapters for the last week of Jesus Christ. He writes so much about that last week. Why? Because he's examined the Lamb of God. 
He is showing in those chapters the Lamb of God, which is sinless, which is pure, which is dedicated. There was no spot in him. Then they crucified him. Herod said, I find no fault in him. The people that came to the Sanhedrin couldn't even come up with a lie that went for the lies about Jesus. Now watch this. Purge your conscience. Go back to verse 9. Which was a figure for the time then present in which we offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertains to the conscience. Now let me tell you something what the blood of Jesus Christ does. 1 John 1 and 9. He is able and just to forgive us our sin. So the fact is when we confess our sins not under bloods and blood of goats and bulls but under the blood of Jesus Christ it is not only gone but get it out of your conscience if you have put that sin under the blood and Satan comes up well what about this hey it's under the blood it's clean and the Bible is correct and I know it is I'm not even to think about it how's that you know what that Old Testament guy did when he went to the temple and that high priest went in there once a year and offered that blood that guy still had the guilt of it did it really work? Did that did that high priest really go into the Holy of Holies? Or did he just stop off and have a piece of bread? Did you really know? Could you see it? How many people testified that that high priest actually went to the mercy seat? Zero. He went in alone, didn't he? And yet, with the respect of 12 people, followed Jesus Christ from his very ministry. And more people saw Jesus Christ at his resurrection and after his resurrection than those that follow him through his, his living ministry. We have the witness, 11 men principle, to say we saw the resurrected Christ and he did go into that holy place and offer his blood for our sacrifice. How do you know? What did Jesus tell Thomas? Reach in hither and poke your hand. You ever realize what he did? What he told Thomas? Do you realize he said he told me, "Go ahead, thrust your hand into my side." Do you know what that means? The wound. Uh, I'm, I was thinking about that the other day because I got a hole in my foot. It's closing up, but I had a hole that you could poke something through. I've seen the doctor do it. When we think of scar for Jesus Christ, wounds, it's still open. If Thomas can thrust his hand or put his finger through, well, what about Jesus Christ going into the most holy place? Forget about the most holy place. He is seated at the right hand of the Father right now. How's that? He is not gone into the mercy seat he is seated right on the mercy seat with the father now how's that you can't get a high priest there listen they have a bihoon and the uh, went into the holy place struck a match or a big lighter or something and pfft, they were gone so jesus christ has done something more than a high priest he had because uh, i'm excluding judas because judas was not there when he died Judas was not there when he rose from the grave, so I'm saying the 11. Jesus has a testimony of 11 where the only high priest, you know, he could have stopped off and had some bread and say, okay, it's done. He could have. No one was ever sure what the high priest what he did in there. No one knew what he thought of. He probably went into that most holy place trenching in his boot, scared, sweating, and he couldn't sweat. He had to have, he had to have the, the, an outfit that would not cause sweat. Jesus Christ sweat great drops of blood in prayer and suffered and died that I may have eternal life. Once offered himself without spot to God. Purge your conscience. Your conscience. You couldn't do that in the Old Testament. From dead works. What's the dead works? Blood of bulls, goats, ashes of the heifer, un to be unclean, sanctified by purifying of the flesh. That was unclean. Dead works. T 
to serve the living God, Jehovah. Those Jews know exactly what that statement is. That's Jehovah. You say, well, so you keep saying Jehovah, Jehovah, Jehovah. Yeah, because I'm talking about the Hebrews. I'm talking about the Hebrews <coughs> coming out of the Old Testament. I'm talking about the writers writing to a bunch of Jews who know the Old Testament. And they're trying to bring, the, the subject is trying to bring the Old Testament to the Hebrews in 64 AD, around that date, trying to show them Jesus Christ, trying to show them it is better for a Christian than it was for a Jew in the Old Testament. That's the reason of Hebrews. He is writing a book telling us how he's witnessing the Jews. And for this cause, he, Jesus, is the mediator of the New Testament, his death. His death brought the testament that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. So Christ, when he died and suffered and bled, was able to take the, the new the Old Testament saints out of Abraham's bosom because the bulls and goats couldn't do it. They could only do something to show their faith to God, but that couldn't finish the work. The one that finished the work is the great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. And for this cause, he, Jesus, is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, Calvary, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, Old Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance, David, Solomon, and all them. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Four. Where a testament is, now we're going to explain death. There must also of necessity be the death of a testator. Now you've all seen the, the, the program on the television. The guy dies and they're all in the lawyer's office and they're about to re read the will. Well, you're not going to open that will if the guy had not died. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Now let me tell you something. When you open up to before Matthew in your Bible and it says New Testament, in reality it's wrong. I'm going to tell you when the New Testament begins. Matthew 27.50, Mark 15.37, Luke 23.46, John 19.30. Those verses I gave you out of the four Gospels state the fact that Jesus gave up the ghost. When he gave up the ghost, there's the New Testament. Before that, they were still the, under the Old Testament. What did he tell them? Go back, he healed the guy with leprosy. Go back and show the priest. So, for a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is no strength at all while the testator liveth. So we are out of the Old Testament by the death of Jesus Christ. The, the Jews today don't realize there is no more Old Testament for them because Jesus Christ ended it. Whether they want to believe it or not, they are now living in the New Testament. And under the New Testament, it is not bulls and goats and ashes of heifers no more. It is by the blood of the high priest, Jesus Christ, that can only cleanse them of their sins. And if they don't do that, they will die and go to hell. There is no Abraham's bosom. There is no animal sacrifices for them. There is no more tabernacle. There is no more temple today for them. God has completely shut out that Old Testament for them. They can't do nothing. This time. Once the rapture happens and they're in the time of Jacob's trouble, then there'll be the tabernacle. Then there'll be the law of return. Right now, no. 
For when Moses had spoken, every priest said to all the people according to the law, He took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wood and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and the people. Exodus 24. That signified that put the people under the Old Testament. What was the death that brought the Old Testament? What did it say? Calves and goats. So the Old Testament really began with Moses killing those calves and goats and sealing those people with their blood by sprinkling the blood in the water. Do you get what verse 19 has already happened in, in John? What happened when Jesus died on that cross and they took him off? What came out? The blood in the water. There you go. Now that doesn't leave you to another avenue for this for this person that witnessed to the Jews. When they pierced that side, out came blood, blood and water. But here, 19, this established, this is the date, Exodus 24 of the Old Testament. Because there was a death of an animal. Well, the New Testament, Matthew 27, 50, Mark 15, 37, Luke 23, 46, John 19, 30, there was a death. The Lamb of God would take away the sin of the world. So there's two trivia questions you want to ask. When did each testament begin? What causes a testament to begin? Death. Saying, this is the blood of the testament which God has enjoined unto you, calves and goats. It's quite interesting that Moses did this. And when Moses was up in the mountain the first time, what was that golden image that Aaron made? A calf. What is the image that is brought to you by a chicken outlet that is worshiping churches today? You know, eat more chicken. Calves. Cows. That brought the Old Testament. And it wasn't worshiping the cow or the goat. It was to see further when the Lamb of God that comes. And John the Baptist proclaimed when the ministry of Jesus was ju just about to begin. John's proclamation was, there is the Lamb of God. There he is. Cows and the goats and all that is done. He's got three and a half more years, and when he dies, that's it. That blood, that's slain. Moreover, he sprinkled the blood, both the tabernacle that was built, and all the vessels of the ministry, the brazen altar, the spoons, everything. They were all put under the blood. But this was for the heirs of the people. Now we have the sinless perfection. Those animals, even though how good you looked at those animals, they could have been scarred. They could have been, but not Jesus Christ. So all the ministry vessels were sprinkled. And yet today, under the New Testament, if you were to sprinkle anything like Moses did, what was the, what's the only thing you can sprinkle today? in the church as a ministry item the bible we don't have tables come on we're talking about people here we're not talking about the stupid building we don't have tables we don't have animals we bring we don't have a fire we don't have ashes the only thing we, we have is the word of god and the words of Christ are in red. The Geneva Bible was called the Martyrs Bible because the Geneva Bible is when many Christians were killed for their belief in the Word of God. The Bible that we hold in our hands, the King James Bible, has been sealed by blood. 
the blood of Jesus Christ and the blood of faithful people who loved it and read it and followed the cleansing, the sevenfold cleansing of the King James Bible. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall never pass away. There's nothing in the church today physical. Nothing at all. More he sprinkled the blood both in the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Almost. And without shedding of blood is no remission. So why couldn't Jesus come and sprinkle everybody with a fire hydrant? You have to have blood. God prescribed before the law, during the law, and after the law, no eating of blood. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. I want you to offer animal sacrifices, their blood, because I want you to show that that blood of my son is coming. You notice how he never said the blood of men. As the false worshippers did, and they, they killed their own children, and they offered their children to, uh, uh, to the gods. God never said that. Because the man, the man's sin, his blood is the sin. Our blood has impurities. But in order to be saved, you've got to have a bloody religion. You can't have someone say, we're saved by baptism. That's not blood. You're saved by what church you go to. That's not blood. You've got to be saved by... Uh, Eating a, a, a piece of cracker and alcoholic drink. That's not blood. It has to be a bloody sacrifice. The, Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, Acts 28, the blood of God, cleanses all, cleanses all from our things. <clears throat> it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these but the heavenly things themselves which better sacrifices than these the old testament christ is much better he's the heavenly sacrifice he's the second adam from heaven the first adam of dirt he's still dirt he's cursed of the ground but jesus christ who came from heaven above all of heaven he's much better animals came from the ground they're not much better. It was only a symbol and a type to Christ came. Once Christ came and died on that cross, no more animal sacrifices. They're done with. Christ is the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. No more. Don't need any more. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. That temple they're staring at right now. Christ did not go into the holy place there. He taught there. Man, he was in the treasury. He went there and knocked down tables and all that. According to his verse, he never went into the holy place and he never went into the most holy place. They would never allow him. Do you realize if they believe who Jesus Christ really was, wouldn't you think that would be the first two steps those priests would have done? You're the Messiah, you're God? Yes, I am. Come with us. You realize that would have been that would have been the, the true truth for them to believe on Jesus as God? Come on with it. Go, go in that most holy place. For there for Christ is not entered the holy place made with hands, which are the figure of the true. Remember, Moses got the blueprints, he got the patterns from God. Either he saw what was in heaven, or God showed him somehow what the pattern in heaven was. But into heaven itself, Acts chapter 1, now to appear in the presence of God for us. There he is. He is seated at the right hand of God right now in the heavenly tabernacle, in the most holiest of the holiest of the holiest. Which according to the scriptures, as a child of God, I am too. Which according to Paul, what he tells us, Jesus is seated right there. According to this verse right here, Christ is making intercessions for us. 
the Holy Spirit is praying, praying and groaning that we can't utter. You see how the, the writer of Hebrews is trying to bring that Old Testament and trying to bring them in the new. Things we've already studied in the Pauline epistle. Things that we've already seen is true. They're trying to get them to the Hebrews. Very slowly. Why? Why nine chapters so far? And the Bible says they're stiff-necked people. They're the kind of people that pull their shoulder. They won't listen. Trying hard. Not yet. Excuse me. Nor yet. That he should offer himself often. As the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. Christ does not need to do it every year. He has done it once with God's blood. Not goats, not lambs, not anything. But his own blood once. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Christ is that one and only sacrifice and no other. Don't you put him back on the cross. It's sacrilege to put him back on the cross. It's against the scriptures to put him back on the cross. When you wear Jesus nailed to the cross in between, on your necklace or your tattoo or your church, when you put him back on the cross, you're violating scripture. You are saying that Jesus is nailed on that cross a second time. And the Bible says once. Now you'll stand before God one day, saved or lost. You'll have to give an account why you nailed him back to that cross. How's that? When you wear that item, him being nailed to the cross, you are saying he's nailed a second time. Or either that, you're saying he never was buried and he never arose from the dead. I don't even want to go there. Is either you're saying you put him back on the cross after he rose from the grave, or he never went to the grave and he never rose from the grave because you still got him nailed. You are on bad ground. I take that crucifix and I bang it all pieces like Moses did with that golden calf and destroy it. It's not Bible. Cursed is he that hangeth on a tree, the Bible says. So you're wearing a curse. Get rid of it. For then must all, he ought often have suffered nope since the foundation of the world but now once in the end of all the world has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice himself and as it is a point unto men once to die yeah, we die once but after this the judgment After your death, you're going to be judged. There is really one physical death for man. You say, well, Lazarus died. Well, he died again and went into the grave and stayed there. They can recitate you and get the paddles. You're, you're going to die once. And then you'll be judged. One final death of your, of your body, your soul, and your spirit. Then you'll be judged. So Christ was once offered. As man dies once, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Why not all? Anybody who's involved in any public ministry knows why that says many. Because not all will be saved. Few will go the broad way. A few will go the straight gate. Many will go the broad way. Not everybody will be saved. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many shows that there is no universal salvation for all men. That's what the Jews really believe. That at the end there's going to be this one great judgment and everybody will work out good. 
somehow, some way. No. And unto them that look for him. Now that's a bold statement making to the Hebrews. You're going to look for Jesus after the entire nation said crucify him? At what point in time are the Jews going to be looking for Jesus? Remember the book is Hebrews. We're not talking about Christians. Hebrews. What time are they going to be looking for Jesus? The second advent. Here he comes to, to, to save them. To then look for him shall he appear the second time. The second advent. So they saw him once. Walking around, talking, healing, signs, wonders, miracles. He's now, they, as far as they know, they claim to be at the right hand of the Father. And guess what? He's coming back. And that's exactly what he told them. Without sin, him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. He's coming back again for those Jews to save them. The, wherever we're at, going to give them a new heart. Going to write the laws in their heart, not on stone. He's going to cleanse them of their sin. He's going to he's going to get rid of their enemies that cursed them. He's going to bless them that, that that bless them. He's going to set up that millennial kingdom, and woo wee, that Jew's going to be happy, tribul, trib, uh, uh, jubilee, no more tribulation. So God is not finished with the Jews. 